And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer into the temple, creator of the upcoming Lost Roads of, Lo of Lokium. And, and a man who loves his percentile die. The one and only Rasmus Strand. How are you doing today, man? Yeah, I'm doing fine. Thank you. Thank you for coming on and braving time zone hell to come all the way to my temple. Thank you for having me. So, I'd like to start at the humble beginnings, as I often do. Uh, walk me through your first introduction to role-playing games and what made it stick. Uh, that would be early 80s. Um, I am a first-generation role player, I guess. Uh, and I think I got to play a Minotaur, and that was pretty darn, pretty darn cool. Mm -hmm. And uh, then I started game mastering because I realized that my friend didn't actually know the rules. I was making it up as he went along, which meant that the game was very confusing and not very consistent and eventually not very fun and uh, then i've been game mastering ever since so that's mm -hmm. been 40 ish years now mm -hmm. do you remember what game it was that was that was the gateway drug as it were the first games i played was dragon quest uh and another game named mutant which is now mutant year zero mm -hmm. in its latest incarnation i think yeah uh, uh, and then uh, it was Chill, the old horror game. Ah, uh, the the old one from. One of these days, I'm gonna have to do a a retrospective on pace setter games because there's a lot of interesting stuff they put out. Yeah, that was a long time ago. Yeah. Uh, and then we tried to play Lord of the Rings, which was off the Rollmaster system, uh, yeah, her... which was awful, uh, and, and nearly killed the hobby for a lot of my friends because they realized that they had to do math and not have fun anymore. You can do you can do both. Just some just some people. I'd say I'd say math I'd say math is not, math is not the um is not the barrier when it comes to merp. It's the charts. Well, sure. <laughs> yeah, they don't help. Not a lot. Uh, and the funny thing, the thing I will find eternally funny is Merp is 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 billed as having a simplified version of the Rollmaster rule set, which it technically does. It does, yeah. I played Rollmaster too, and that's just even even more awful. So yeah, no. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but we got out of that and and evolved. Mm -hmm. But it. Now with Lo with Lost Roads of Lokium, was this a camp was this a campaign setting you had been playing in for a while that you decided to make into its own thing? Well, I I started like the very first version of this game I wrote back in ninety one, and it was just pure garbage. And then over the years, I've iterated on this over and over and over. Uh, so the version that's coming out now, the Age of the Black Chimera, is actually version 15. Mm -hmm. And it's it's always been its own thing. And it's sort of grown over time. The, the setting has grown more and more elaborate. Like the very first thing, it only had like one page of backstory because I wasn't interested in that. I was only interested in, oh, I found out this cool combat mechanic I want to try. And um, and then the, the campaign setting the the game setting i should say has grown very organically because the the players have ventured into different places forcing me to write what what it's like there and why it's like that and what's the history of that place so it's it's all very organic most of the chronology in the actual background chapter is stuff that has been discovered over time by players of previous versions mm -hmm. now with with that in mind, if I'm not mistaken, you're using a D100 system. Is that is that going to be roll high or roll low? It's roll low. You need to roll under your trait, mm -hmm. and the 
the more difference you have between your trait and the role, the better off you'll be. All, all right. I'm get. I'm guessing. I'm guessing there's some, there may, is there some equivalent to critical if you're rolling five or less or three or less. It's a natural one is a perfect roll, and a natural hundred is a botch. Mm -hmm. So now going through going through it, it do, it does look like you have a you have a set of um, a set of archetypes, and also on the character sheet, I see the spot for professional training. Um, are is professional training your equivalent of a archetype system? Not classes per se, but a starting package. No, so professional training is something that just happens as you mature. Um, you you if you make your own character, it is one of the many dice rolls that you do in order to randomly build your character. Uh, it's very rarely a choice. You get to choose um, to either to either do the role or to default to something that maybe your your ancestry is known for. So if you come from an ancestry of blacksmiths, you can go to oh, I'm going to be a blacksmith. I'm not going to roll on the table because I don't want to. I don't know what where I'm going to end up. And in the end, the professional training matters very little. All it does is give you boosts to a set of different traits and, and maybe some other things and gives you some basic magic. But all those things are stuff you can buy later on with your own experience points. So it, it, you're not locked into this is what you are now or, or classes where you can't not be that anymore. So mm -hmm. professional training is just another part of the character creation process. Yeah. Now, maybe maybe I missed it, but how? But um, when do when creating a character within Lost Roads, how would how would the how would the um starting attributes be determined? Yeah. So the character creation rules isn't in the core rulebook. They they don't fit because the character creation rules is just another hundred pages or so, which is pretty much the size of the core rule book. So it's in its own book uh, called The World to Be. Uh, and you start by rolling uh, your starting stats, which is, uh, well, there are several different methods you can do this by. Uh, the default one is 1d100 divided by 4 plus 25. So it's it's a value between 26 and, uh, and uh, 50. Um, and that is a decent enough startup for a character at age 16 without professional training. Mm -hmm. uh, so anything you add on top of that is added on top of your uh, quote unquote natural talent at age 16. You haven't learned that much stuff yet. Um, but you can also, there's a point by system and there's some other ways you can roll. Uh, you can roll a pool and, and spend points from that or you can have a fixed point cost you want to do if you don't like rolling on tables you can buy results on tables like it's really open but it does allow you to randomly determine your character and using the system you can roll approximately three trillion different characters without getting the same character twice mm -hmm. um, because there are there are a lot of potential combinations of roles in that in the in the book yeah <clears throat> Now, one of the th one of the things that I f that I find interesting is with some of the with some of the cl with some of the archetype with some not archetypes but some of the abilities you have them separated into their into their own set of um, um, associated mechanics. Especially, obviously, magic and faith being the being the um, being the main ones. I'm curious if ma if magic and faith are things that you that would have some degree of barrier to entry, or if you roll them at, at character creation like everything else. You roll them like everything else, but they are more expensive to improve using your experience points. Some traits are just easier to master. It's easier to learn how to climb a tree than it is how to learn how to fight. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's easier to learn how to fight than it is how to learn to use magic. Mm -hmm. So it's just a, a a multiplier to the experience cost if you want to increase that trait based on which trait it is. Yeah. Uh, so it there's essentially 
five different costs. So the, the traits are are grouped in five groups so that there are some traits that are super, super cheap. You can increase them as much as you want fairly mm -hmm. cheaply. And then faith and magic at the very top tier where you have to invest a bunch of points in order to actually climb and get anywhere. But of course, the effect is kind of startling if you have a high enough magic and or faith. Mm -hmm. Now I've seen some, now when it comes to the when it comes to the relationship between magic and faith I've seen I've seen some I've seen some games use it as um two as two different forms of as two different forms of casting some ha, some go a bit further than that so I, but I'd like to I'd like to start with the way magic works I'm guessing because I'm guessing that based on what based on what I'm seeing. There is no, there is not really a magic re, there is not really a magic resource aside from what you ha, aside from the preparations that you have that you have available to you. There's not there is not anything like sa like sanity or so, or something like that that you that would yeah. Need, there are no spell, spell slots or mana points or anything mm -hmm. like that in the system. No. no, it's just a straight roll. Yep. Well, the the. The thing you encounter is that certain effects are very, very difficult to obtain with a straight roll. So you need to stack some positive modifiers on top of them. And to get those positive modifiers, you need to take a bunch of time where you need to spend a bunch of money on rare resources like material components, or you have to sit down and, and carve a bunch of glyphs in the ground or, or whatever. And that means that even if you'd like to just sit and spam spells all day, you just don't have the time or the money to do that. So you have to mm -hmm. pick your pick your battles, as it were. Yeah. Now, with that in with that in mind, I see that I see that there's the there's a few uh, there's a few elements on the character sheet that I wanted to go into detail in in terms of how they are associated with magic. The first being um, fathom. Yeah. So magic, the trait magic, which is, I don't know, the attribute or mm -hmm. the skill of magic, is, is broken down into three parts. Uh, one is fathom, one is lower magic, and one is higher magic. And fathom is just a sense of magic. So for us in this world, we have eyes because there's light, so that we can perceive things using that light. And uh, there's also sound, so we do have ears to pick up that sound. And in Lokyam, there is magic. So pretty much every sentient creature has a sense of magic. So they can pick out like the direction of the nearest magical source because it's just so prevalent around them. And the higher your magic trait, the better off you are at sniffing out uh, what sort of magic it is. Or maybe even uh, pick out specific undertones in the the background hum of magic around you to go ooh there's a magic item over there or this magic isn't actualized yet it could be a dormant magic ooh so maybe not push this door open because there could be a rune on the other side that will blow us up stuff like that so the higher your magic the the better of your your fathom or your magic sense is mhm mm now in in the now that brings me to the line between lower and higher magic. Yeah. Um, especially, especially since there's also the entries for um, sphe for spheres when it comes to higher magic. So, what would be the dividing line between a between a lower magic effect and a higher one? Yeah. So, lower magic is stuff you learn as part of your professional training. It's just the way that that an it's the mundane magical training of any profession in this world. So a blacksmith would learn basic magic tricks that would aid them in their craft. Uh, a, a fighter, a warrior would not learn those tricks. They would learn some other tricks, but they would still utilize magic if they have the talent for it. So these are just simple, easy little effects uh, you don't have a casting time. They don't have material components, nothing like that. All you do is a straight roll against your magic. And if you pull it off, then you get one of, of two or, or in one effect, it's three. 
Mm -hmm. uh, you can learn the lower magic of, of any professional training. You just get one of them for free if your magic talent is high enough. And you can get whatever else, whatever other ones you you want later on in the game. But those are just tied to your professional training and, and are simple things. And then if you want to go into pointy hat, uh, stars uh, embroidered on your robe, fireball territory, then you get to higher magic and that's where the spheres are. Yeah. And are the, are the spheres essentially com um, categories of, ma of magic? Yeah, I would say so. There are five spheres in the core rulebook. Uh, there's the sphere of change, which is just mad, wild stuff like changing your appearance or growing wings or um, uh, turning rock into sand or whatever. Uh, and then there's the sphere of fire, which does exactly what it says on the tin. Uh, and then there's the sphere of the body, which includes healing and paralysis and resurrection and all that kind of good stuff. Mm -hmm. And then sphere of water, and finally the sphere of wind. So those are the five in the core rule set. Uh, one of the stretch goals in the Kickstarter is for an adventure, which also includes the sphere of nightmares. So there are a bunch of more spheres um coming up it's just that i couldn't fill the book with just hundreds of pages of spheres no one would would like that i think so they, they're no. just five kinds of magic and you can learn as many as you want if you have enough magical talent and there's there's 15 effects per sphere so it's not like you're going to run out of stuff if you only know one sphere it's not like you learned one spell you learned 15 spells when you learned a sphere Mm -hmm. Now, taking that into taking that into account, when it comes to when it comes to when it comes to um, I was going to go into combat, but I want to hold off on that. When it comes to faith, um, yep. I based on what I'm seeing, I doubt I doubt that faith has its has its own has its own little spell list, but has a different sort of effect. Yeah, so magic and faith aren't related at all. I, I didn't want to make faith into another type of magic. Mm -hmm. So faith uses another set of mechanics entirely. They aren't related at all. Uh, and the only thing there is that some gods prefer to do certain kinds of miracles. So uh, a god that prefers slaughter and murder is likelier to listen to a prayer involving slaughter and murder than one asking for advice. Whereas uh, a god that's more sort of maybe, maybe a bit more laid back and sage-like is more likely to listen to and fulfill mm -hmm. a plead for sagely advice than for murder and blood and, and carnage. So there's a, a different set of mechanics in play when it comes to faith. Mm -hmm. So, with that in, now, with that in mind, what, how would exa how exactly would divine favor um, work? Yeah, so divine favor is a a sort of boon that you can entreat your god into giving you once per adventure. Uh, so you make a, a fairly sticky faith roll. And if you manage to, to, to stick the landing on that one, then your god's going to smile and go, sure, gotcha. And then you you get your divine favor. And you can use it once and only once during the adventure to just add your faith trait to any one role. Mm -hmm. So say, for instance, that you are in a fight and it's not going well and you roll like crap, then you can just add your faith to your martial score. Or you can add your faith to your athletic score so that you can jump that one chasm that you want to do. Or you can add your divine favor to a faith roll to really get that miracle that you need. But you can use it only once per adventure. You can't get it back uh, until the adventure is over. Mm -hmm. So the the next thing that I want the next thing that I wanted to ask is since you mentioned get um fighting, um. Uh, is is regarding Marshall. I'm now. I'm guessing that at that um, because of the because of the line, but because of the line between with 
between with equipment and with equipment ranged. I'm guessing that ha that um your martial role would take would take a hit if you are if you um are wearing heavy armor, for instance. So, the martial trait is a combination of a bunch of factors. It's your speed and agility and coordination and combat savvy and how enduring you are and how good you are with the sword in hand and all these kind of things. And equipment will just simply add on top of your martial score. So the heavier armor you have, the higher your martial score is going to be in, in the end. If you have a very heavy armor, you might actually need uh, a bit of a score in athletics. Otherwise, you're just going to fall over when you try to walk around in that thing. It, it'll just weigh too much for you. But mm -hmm. other than that, it's it's just a straight addition to your uh, martial score, depending on what you picked and, and how well trained you are with either that weapon or that armor. And then you get a score, and it's that score at the end which you roll against. So two fighters with the same martial score, one being armed with a stick, and one being armed with an uh, with heavy armor and a, a great big two-handed sword is is likely not going to be a fair fight even though their martial score was initially the same one of them will still be at their initial level the other one could well be double mm -hmm. the initial score because they've gotten all this groovy gear that they can now use for some mayhem mm -hmm. now that br that brings me to proficiencies. How I've seen proficiencies used in a wide variety of ways. How would they work in this system? So proficiencies are only for marshals. It's I, I know the word is very co-opted in Dungeons and Dragons as something else, uh, but in this system, proficiency is all about your martial skills, and it is a, a specialization into a type of weapon or mm -hmm. a type of armor. So. You're a decent enough fighter as it is, but with a sword, you're deadly. That sort of thing. Mm -hmm. So it's not like you're worse off if you're fighting without a sword. It's just that if you get a sword, then it's not just any sword in your hand. It's it turned into a, an instrument of surgical precision because you actually went to fencing academy for 22 years. Mm -hmm. So proficiency double well it depends on how much proficiency you have but it it does multiply the effect of the equipment that you put on so if you are proficient with a weapon that would normally give you 10 in martial it will give you 15 or 20 or 25 instead of 10 so a sword in the hand of a, a real swordsman is way more dangerous than in the hand of just someone a, a sword is still a dangerous thing even in untrained hands but in the hands of a fencing master Oh, Nelly, mm -hmm. um, it's just gonna it's just gonna go bad. It's just gonna go bad for everyone. Yeah, and now, that's the thing with armor. You can you can train to use armor more effectively. Turn into the blow. Use your shoulder, uh, your shoulders, or your your upper armor, your upper arm uh, armor to deflect blows if you're trained enough. And then the effect of your armor gets multiplied as well. Mm -hmm. So there's armor or weapon training. Yeah. Now, one. Th now give now with all with all of that. When it comes to when it comes to combat, in in the, in a in a would in that kind of situation, martial be used as the equivalent to initiative, or is it a case where roles are simultaneous? Yeah, there's no initiative because there's no turns in this game. Uh, combat is a one roll affair. You roll one die to determine it, how well you do in this fight. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's, let's say for instance that that we have two fighters and they both have 50 in martial with equipment. They go into combat. Uh, they pick up their D100s. Uh, they both roll. One of them rolls 25. So that means that their difference is then 25 because 50 minus 25 is 25. And the other one rolls 47, so their difference is 3. So the one that has a difference of 25 won this combat. And then there's a little table that tells you how badly they won this combat. But the winner is determined by a single roll. So combat can 
it's not very forgiving, which means that you have to plan this out and not just try to murder Hobo your way through the world because one bad dice roll and it could be over. So you need to be a you need to be a different kind of problem solver than just the kind that goes, well, I have an axe, let's go. Um, it, it's just not going to work out for you at every turn. Yeah. So it's one roll to determine all of one combat. So there's no initiative, there's no turns, no actions, no flanking, no prone condition, nothing like that. It's just one single roll that, that does all of it. Given that, I'm curious if the, if there's any... Ma- if if there's any major differences or any contributions to if, to somewhat to um, different equipment, if if there's any dif- difference in approach, if someone's using a long sword or if they're using a battle axe, just as in it, just as a um, example. Yeah, no, the, it's just a matter of of having that equipment, mm-hmm. and if they're trained with that equipment. The only difference you can get is if you have a ranged weapon and your opponent does not. Because then you can get take pot shots at them as they try to get to you, and that of course is a huge advantage because they can't hit you back. That's great, yep. but um, but uh, no, there's a combat is a combat. I, I I think I think it's Daenerys in one of the songs of Ice and Fire books. Uh, I can't remember which one where she's looking at a gladiatorial arena. And there are two fighters in there. And there's one that's like a lumbering giant with plate armor. Mm-hmm. And then there's one little nimble dude with like a rapier. And and they're, they're discussing that, of course, the strong guy is going to win because he just needs one hit to, to kill the other guy. And he goes, well, he's not going to land a hit because the other guy just keeps dancing around and stabbing him in the knees over and over. And I think I took that to heart, that it doesn't matter in what way you are dangerous. It only matters if you are dangerous. Uh, So the system reflects that. And it doesn't matter what fighting style you do. It's only a matter of, are you any good at the fighting style that you're using? So if you're wading into combat with your your battle axe and no armor at all, you just happen to be really good at battle axe, then your chances of coming up on top against someone who is maybe less trained with their sword and shield but wearing armor is is not bad um because it doesn't matter how you fight it only matters how well you fight yeah um i suppose i suppose like a corollary to that would be um if a weapon of a weapon that has that has reach is is something is something that would play a factor of or if it's in the same or if it has the same answer yeah, no, it's the it's same answer. It's only ranged weapons like slings and bows and javelins that mm-hmm. that actually makes a difference in a in a fight. And given given that, I'm get I'm guessing that there are some disadvantages if so, if somebody wanted to try and use a ranged weapon in in close range. Yeah, they're not going to be able to. Uh, once you get into close combat, you can't use your ranged stat anymore. You can only use your melee stat. Mm-hmm. You you just. In in a fight, if if fight isn't in turns anymore, but we're talking maybe half a minute, minute of fencing, there's no contest between a person using a sword and a person trying to use a bow. Like that is that's a bad fight for anyone. You're better off dropping the bow and trying to grapple your opponent at that point. So so no, you can't use your ranged weapon once you get into melee range. So if they get to you, you just have to forsake the fact that you are robin hood you're just not going to be able to land a hit at that range anyway so Mm -hmm. then you just have to default to your dagger or short sword instead and hope that you can carry on through Mm -hmm. so with that with that in with that in mind um i do find it interesting that that um communication is its is its own stat with so with some notations regarding language because that's something a lot of a lot of designers tend to overlook is the is the way le- the way languages work yeah so communication is so all the traits there there are there are only 12 of them uh all the traits are combined talents and skills and attributes and stuff they're they're umbrella terms so communication as a trait is both how charming and manipulative and seductive and intimidating that you are. 
but it also covers how good you are at languages. So if you have a high communication score, you might actually know quite a few foreign languages. But if you have a low score, you can only speak your native language and you have a thick, very easily recognized accent at that. So it, it all falls under that sort of subheader. And you can learn foreign languages. And then there's also an optional rule uh, that talks about how the differences that sort of dialect, I guess, of the human language, uh, because all humans share the same language, has developed so that races of humans that live, for instance, on the, the glaciers will have more words for snow and ice than would um, a similar tribe that lived in the tropics. Mm -hmm. uh, those would probably have more words for fish because the, the ice shelf living ones are just not going to have that many different fish to, to talk about. Mm -hmm. So that's where there's an optional rule called related words uh, in which you can role play the fact that I am now using words for fish that your character simply wouldn't understand. They would just hear sort of a wah, 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 wah noise because you don't have a term to relate that to. But when you are talking about snow, then I'm just up the same creek because for me, snow is like, well, it's a concept at least. I know what it is, but it's not like I know the difference between this kind of snow and that kind of snow, which is vital to you because you live on the glacier. So um, that's it's a sort of a fun little role-playing thing that we put in many years ago now. And it's it's been it's been annoying to people who try to play the game for the first time because they don't get it. Uh, but it's it's a fun thing for people who've played for a while and want to engross themselves in what their characters actually are like. And then they get an, a unique way of speaking because they use all of these terms that mm -hmm. other folk just wouldn't get. Yeah, as, as far as not getting it, I, I look at that as a, as a case of having to, of people having to unlearn bad habits. Just yeah. for, Just because there's... It's a it's a consequence of of what happens when when there's this idea of how things are supposed to work in a fantasy game. Yeah. Except. Yeah, I can see that. I I um. I guess. I'm. I guess the best. I guess the best analog I I can think of is when, when um pe when you have somebody who, who um. Who ha who for the longest time has dri has driven stick has driven stick and then they have to then they have to then they have to learn automatic just not yeah. not not having the stick is is one thing that they have to get used to but the bigger thing is just how is just the rhythm of how, of how they drive period i think that all games well pretty much anything i think should come with it a slight mm -hmm. learning curve you should be able to look at this and go, oh, I don't know all of this stuff. Mm -hmm. How much of this do I need to take on board right now? Yeah. How much do I need to, to have figured out by tomorrow? And how much of this do I need to figure out in order to, to get it fully or to enjoy it fully? Yeah. Um, uh, so so mm -hmm. that's why most of the rules in the game are optional. Mm -hmm. The basic rule is just roll under your trait and you succeed. Everything else is just garnish. The... I, another analog I could I could use it if you don't mind me using a video game example is Dark Messiah of Might and Magic. A right. lot of people would look at that game and think that you'd play it like a first person fantasy experience, which you can do that, but that's not what the game is trying to is trying to teach you in its tutorial. It's trying to teach you to utilize its physics system to instead of, instead of trying to win in a straight up fight, um, use the environment to your advantage. You know, right. th you know, cut cut a rope so that so that they end up getting hit by a chandelier instead of trying to instead of trying to sh instead of trying to match them sword for sword. Right. Ah. Uh, and it is it is a it's one of those things that that's a consequence of of assumptions. Um. Now. Given the, given the given what given what I was what I was able to deduce from look from looking at the material so far, um, would you would you say that that Lokiem 
has a li has a little bit of DNA of historical fiction in ter in terms of the set in terms of the setting. I think that maybe maybe second hand. I remember reading uh, Robert Howard, the guy who wrote Conan, mm -hmm. um, and Solomon Kane, and some of those other characters. Mm -hmm. And he had this piece in one of his books where he just briefly outlines the history of Hyboria, the the land that Conan lives in. And I remember reading that and going, you know, for a fictional land for fictional history this is awfully well thought out and it it rings true because it is at least consistent uh, a lot of fantasy especially just fancy literature uh, is just not consistent or logical because well magic it's fine right um you have all these gaping holes that that you can't account for and that isn't accounted for in the actual stories. Um, maybe, maybe because the characters in the stories don't know it, but we as readers still require to understand it in order to enjoy it. Otherwise, you get all these fan theories with people going, what, what is winter in Songs of Ice and Fire? Right? What, what, what do you mean winter is coming and how can it last for years? Like This makes no sense. So uh, I, I always endeavored mm -hmm. to write the the background and the setting as if it needed to be at least internally self consistent mm -hmm. it needed to be as uh, it could refer back to itself without creating all these loopholes and weird glitches where you go huh why would that happen yeah. it is it's supposed to be explained it's supposed to be a natural effect of something that happened before that uh, dating back to sort of the start of of the chronology of the world so in that sense i guess it's a bit more like historical historical fiction than it is just straight up fantasy but there's still dragons and magic so there's enough there's enough fantasy in there to go around i think yeah um when it comes when it comes to that inconsistency thing you mentioned i've had i've had my own theories um primarily and i'd, I'd like to say I, i'd like to say i came up with this concept but that's not true I remember speaking with somebody who had who had done work on on um directing episodes of various TV shows and he mentioned the importance of what he called a series bible. This document some sometimes in book form sometimes not that is meant to contain characters, plot lines etc. do you keep everything consistent? Even if even if some of the stuff isn't stuff that is that, that is going to be actually in the script. Um, it's important to keep that in just so that just so everybody is on the same page. And I think a combination of that as well as a lot of people thinking that you need to do the this that um, British Isles Tolkien-esque approach to fantasy, otherwise it's not fantasy, which is a whole other issue. Yeah. Contri contributes to the contributes to the matter. And even with um even with something like magic. And it's funny you bring that up because I'll be talking about that in the podcast later tonight. Magic is a narrative blank check. And because of that, it can make a setting or break it. Yeah. So you have you have to apply you have to apply restrictions. Otherwise, there's going to be questions that are that are asked about why the about why characters didn't didn't just use magic to fix a problem in front of them. Uh -huh. Yeah, and I have two. I have faith as well. Mm -hmm. So I have two of those where people can just sort of wish problems into the cornfield, as it were. Um, but uh, hopefully I've, I've done enough of my due diligence to make sure that at least as far as the characters in the game go, they, they don't feel that they are just left up a certain creek with, without a paddle, but that mm -hmm. they can actually feel that they can lean back and go, okay, this actually makes sense. You can yeah. break the world using these mechanics. Obviously, you can, but that isn't the point of the mechanics. Mm -hmm. uh, and most most players will rather have a a joyful experience than set out to destroy the game. And if they want to destroy the game, fine. That's if that's what you enjoy, do that. Just don't knock on someone else's experience. But yeah. um, but the system is made to be as 
as robust as possible, even though it, it does involve these narrative blank checks, as it were. Mm -hmm. Now, when 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 you've been doing um, play, when you've been doing play testing on the matter, um, did you? Did you did you have any situations where you ended up with a part with a party wipe, especially with this uh, one roll approach that you're taking? So people tend to get a bloody nose first time they go into combat um, because they they are used to another way of thinking of of their character's capabilities. Mm -hmm. So they would just kind of go gung ho and and go into a fight and then just come out going the hell happened like what. What actually happened there? Why did we get beaten? There were there were four of us and there were eight bandits. In any other game, that would have been simple. Why did we get beaten? And then you sort of look at them and go, because the bandits were eight and they were heavily armed and armored. And you're not. And there's half as many of you. And they go, oh, oh, and sort of light bulb moment. And then everyone gets a lot more cautious. So... Party wipes aren't that common because it's not very easy to wipe out an entire group at once unless the very first fight they get into is like the five of them versus 50 people because then they're just going to get chopped into mincemeat. Mm -hmm. But by the time they get to challenges that are that dangerous that they could potentially get wiped out, they will have learned their lesson and go, okay, there's a bit too many of them. We should do something else here. What can we do other than drawing blade and and wading into fighting here? Mm -hmm. So not not often, luckily enough. Yeah. Um. <clears throat> the other the other thing I was I was curious about is what do you do you consider because of how you have the setting um, set up? Do you suppose that Lost Roads could support hex crawls? And I end up asking this a lot. To, when it comes to games that have a very broad um, bullet point like design with their settings, I mean, you could definitely, you could definitely do something like that. And I, I, not in the current way that the rules are structured, but I keep thinking of uh, Attack on Block Thirteen, which is a mini board game uh, with fixed characters and a hex crawl on a on a printed map and like two set missions you could do that was set within a cyberpunk game that I played, gosh, 30 years ago. That cyberpunk game would not have entertained that system, but the board game, because that's what it essentially becomes when you do hex crawls, the board game contained all the rules you needed to convert that into the, the board game state. But there's no way you could do a hex crawl um, or or use models to simulate combat movement the way the rules are written now because every fight would just be well I'm going to walk up and then we're going to fight and then we'll see who wins because that's that's the extent of granularity when it comes to combat everything else would need to be tacked on and then balanced on top of the existing rule structure in one way or another you essentially need to rewrite the combat rules chapter mm-hmm it's not impossible. If I wanted to make a, a board game out of it, I probably could. Yeah. But I, I think, I think a card game is is um, more close to my heart at this point. I had this one idea that I've been kicking around for a decade now about how to build your um, congregation, and you can do it as a card game against the others as they're trying to poach your relics and priests and and holy texts, and you have to sort of beat them at their own game. But I haven't gotten that far yet. For some reason, I immediately thought of Cult of the Lamb. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, sure, why not? Uh, you you would definitely not need to play one of the good churches. You could just play one of the cannibal cults and go, "Ah, oh, man, they stole all my all my uh, the leg chanks that I'd saved from those those crusaders we beat up." Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, why not? Uh, and I suppose I suppose if there's an advantage to to this um what to this one die setup um. It's the fact that if if somebody wants to do an event like say a joust tournament, they're not going to have to quibble all that much. Yeah, so that's actually a very poignant point because there's there's an, there's several expansions that are are written or being written for this game. 
Mm -hmm. And uh, one of them has an adventure called Passing of the Torch, I think it's called, uh, in which the characters are invited to a jousting tournament. Mm -hmm. So that module has rules for jousting tournaments. Like, how does the rules specifically for this round work? Uh, How do the rules for the melee work? How do the, the lance jousting part work? How do the archery part work? How do you score points? Uh, what makes a, a tournament night different from a crusader night? Because it's all show, right? It's there's a. It's almost like the difference between a uh, a boxer and um, uh, a street fighter, or a um, uh, gosh, let's say between a, a wrestler and an MMA fighter. The, the, these are different things because they're different kinds of spectacles. So, so that that module will or that adventure will contain rules for just that specific situation where you go, well, how would that translate? How would the, these rules be used to emulate that specific situation? Like, how is an archery contest going to work if you only have one role? That sort of stuff. Mm-hmm. So, with that with that in mind, I. Th- I think you had you had mentioned that the that um each of the books is going to be around ninety seven pages. What would you be shooting for as far as a release window? Not a yes, da- not a date for the PDS, just a just a um estimate, just a um ballpark. If you if you don't mind me being a bit too American yeah, yeah. with my references. No, uh, the the core rulebook and the world to be as well as the introductory adventure, the lights and old houses, they're all done. They're, they're sent off to the printer already. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I'm waiting for my proofs so I can just make sure that the printer hasn't messed anything up and uh, make the tiny bits of corrections that I need. And then they're ready to launch. So the Kickstarter campaign says that the rewards will be out by May. And the reason I've said May rather than uh, sort of the 5th of February is that uh, I have some other adventures that are stretch goals in the campaign uh, that aren't quite as done yet. So if we unlock those stretch goals, I don't want to delay them because we're we're waiting for something else. So then I've said that May will have everything done, mm-hmm. but uh, it could be way sooner than that. Uh, because this stuff, like I said, it's already done. It's not. This is not a, a project that relies on uh, um, an influx of funds in order to f- to to uh, fund the uh, the actual development of the game. The game is done. The book is done. All I'm want- looking to do is pay my illustrators. Mm-hmm. That is all. Uh, so um, it it's. It's already in the bag and it's ready to to be shown to the world. So if if nothing else happens, the the game will be out before March. Mm-hmm. It'd be fun it'd be funny if um, it would be funny if it released on March fourth, so that, that way I can use that to make a che- to make a cheap joke of saying something like March fourth and get and get lucky. Yeah, sure. I should oh. do a, a I should do a Crusader release on march the 4th i guess <laughs> something lo- something like that yeah but with all that said i do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way to my temple and enjoy the madness at play here thank you for having me and anytime anytime you see fit to return the door is always open as i often say around here drinking is not mandatory but it is encouraged. Right. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay Fucking frosty, everybody!